Hello, everyone. Uh, if you can hear me, please, somebody say yes. We can. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we, uh, I think we'll go ahead and start. Um, we have been, as you all know, we have been talking about sports injuries this month in this series. Um, the, most of our talks were not uh, surgically oriented a lot. Uh, so we, we, today we'll do it a bit different and do something a bit more surgically oriented. We are surgeons in the end. Um, so we'll be talking about biceps tendon pathologies. Um, this is something that we see a lot when we talk about shoulder pathology, uh, sometimes isolated, sometimes in uh, conjunction with other pathologies and um, just being able to identify them. But not only that, but also knowing what to do with them once we have identified them. Uh, I think is something that is always a topic of discussion. Um, today we are joined by Dr. Shamim Osman. Uh, he's currently in the country uh, doing a shoulder, reverse shoulder arthroplasty uh, workshop. And he kindly agreed to just share with us about uh, biceps tendon pathologies. Um, when I was talking to him and just asking and, uh, how long he's been doing uh, these surgeries for sports and uh, arthroscopies, knee, shoulders. I think it's a long time. Uh, it, he's been doing it more than 30 years. I think I may be wrong. I don't quote the, the, the years. Um, he's, a, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's, uh, he currently practices in South Africa. Uh, in a, I think it's KwaZulu Natal. Um, the Ali, the, the hospital, I, I have to remember the name. Anyway, he currently practices in South Africa, but he has practiced in many countries. He's worked in Dublin, he's worked in Mauritius, he's worked in, uh, I think in New Zealand, um, in the UK. Uh, and it's, I think he brings to us, uh, brings with him a, uh, wealth of knowledge in shoulder surgery and with regards to shoulder pathology. Uh, so I, I, I'm glad to introduce him and uh, I'm sure we'll all have a fruitful discussion and I hope that we are able to gain from today's talk. Uh, so thank you once again for joining us. Uh, Dr. Shamim, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, Dr. Mbugwa. Uh, thank uh, you very much. As for having me on, on your Kenya Orthopedic Association talk. Um, so I'm happy to be here and hopefully I can share some knowledge on my experience with bicep problems. Yeah, I've, I've been doing shoulders for 30 years. So I kind of- Oh, okay, so, so I wasn't very wrong. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're right. Um, yeah. so I'm hopefully we'll share my knowledge, but also some of the science behind all these problems that you're gonna see. Okay, good. So I think you can, I think you can go ahead. Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and proceed. Guys, if you have any questions, feel free to just share them on the screen and then we'll discuss them at the, uh, at the tail end of the, of the talk today. All right. Is that okay, go ahead, slide, uh, Dr. Bogwell? Can you see my yes, screen? Yes, you can see your slides. Yes, you can. Thanks. So uh, today's discussion will be about the management of lesions of the long head of biceps. And uh, you've probably heard a lot about biceps. Our French colleagues always are the biceps killers because biceps creates pain. Now let's look at the biceps itself. <clears throat> we know the biceps is biceps because it arises with two heads and we are more interested in the long head of biceps which arises from the suprachiasmatic tubercle uh, the tendon is about nine centimeters long as it comes out of the joint and, become, and joins the short of the biceps and usually about five to six millimeters in diameter. So that's the basic anatomy. When you look at the anatomy of the biceps as it exits the shoulder, which is where we are interested in, you'll see that on the medial side, the thing that's marked MP, it's called medial pulley of the biceps. 
and on the lateral side of the biceps lies the lateral pulley. Also lying medially is the subscapularis, and the roof of the biceps is made up by the coracohumeral ligament. If you look at the schematic representation on top, the coracohumeral ligament arises, uh, sort of covers the top of the biceps and also progresses to form the uh, <clears throat> rotator cable. So this is important to understand because as you go along, you'll understand the anatomy further. We know that the extra articular anatomy, the biceps exits on the biceps groove. It then passes underneath the transverse humeral ligament. And this is quite a thin structure. It's not actually responsible for stabilizing the biceps. And below the transverse humeral ligament, the biceps will then extend for about 45, 46 millimeters, uh, centimeters below this. We, Problems in the proximal biceps are commonly seen in overhead athletes. And I'll show you a slide now as to why. These are due to repetitive impingement on the uh, anterior chromium. And with this, you might develop biceps instability. Tension overload in the biceps will result in uh, rupture of the biceps. And these are also associated commonly with rotator cuff or labral lesions. So patients also complain of a popping sensation throwing positions, and the presentation could be either insidious or often acute event. So when you, what's the most reliable test for assessing the proximal biceps? Uh, the groove tenderness was found to be the most reliable clinical test. How do you find the groove? With the arm uh, in 10 degrees of internal rotation, the biceps groove would be almost directly in line with that area. And tenderness in this region is very suggestive of biceps pathology. Uh, what was also found in this study was ultrasound guided injections into the biceps sheath. Uh, if that resolves the patient's pain, it was highly suggestive of a biceps pathology. The ultrasound guided injections had a high sensitivity and specificity uh, in relation to a diagnosis of biceps pathology. Clinical test, um, the yoga sons test is basically, you keep the arm, you can see the arm is held in about 10 degrees of internal rotation. The, the thumb or finger is kept in the biceps groove and you ask the patient to actively supinate the forearm and this will create pain and tenderness in this region. The speeds test is basically keeping the arm in supination and asking the patient to forward flex the shoulder and that could give you clinical pain. O'Brien's test is relative to the biceps as well as to the biceps superior anchor, which is the superior labrum. In this, firstly, the patient's arm is put into uh, internal rotation and 10 degrees of adduction, and you'll test the strength. This will usually elicit pain if there's biceps pathology. You repeat this in supination and the pain will disappear. So that's the Brian's test. Other investigations, apart from clinical investigations, MRI is commonly done, it's useful when you want to look at the biceps pulley lesions or biceps instability, and of course, can easily identify rotator cuff tears. For primary biceps pathology, uh, there's poor correlation of MRI compared to arthroscopy, which essentially means that you sometimes will only diagnose biceps pathology when you do an arthroscopy of the shoulder. So it's almost twice the amount of patients that uh, are more <clears throat> clinically or, or should I, diagnosed by arthroscopy. Ultrasound as well, it can be useful and to check for biceps instability. And if you look at this view on the side, you'll see that the biceps groove is now empty, but the biceps are now lying perched on the lesser tuberosity. Arthroscopy is done using standard portals. We always use the anterior portal, and this is almost like putting your finger into the joint. On the picture on the left, you'll find that this is called the ramp test. And essentially, you'll use a probe from anterior portal and draw the biceps into the joint. And that gives you a fair assessment of the intra as well as part of the extra anatomy and, uh, of the biceps. So if the biceps is damaged, you get this fish scale appearance, which you see on the right hand side. And when you see this fish scale appearance, this is almost diagnostic of biceps pathology and that differentiates it from rotator cuff pathology. So coming to 
the disorders are associated with the proximal biceps. It can be broadly classified into three groups, either inflammatory, traumatic, or bicep instability. Primary inflammatory arthritis, uh, inflammation of the biceps may be either primary, which is related to bicep, directly to the bicep tendon, or secondary to other pathology in the joint. Trauma could be either a rupture of the biceps or disruption of the superior labrum, which is where the biceps attachment is. And of course, biceps instability. So we'll break this down into all these groups and have a look at them clearly. Inflammatory conditions, as mentioned, primary tenosynovitis of the biceps is very uncommon. It's only about 5% of the time. And the synovitis is isolated to the tendon. When you pull the biceps into the joint, you see this typical red appearance of the biceps, which is on the upper part of the biceps. And this is called a lipstick sign because it looks like lipstick. So this is highly suggestive of tenosynovitis of the biceps. If left alone, the biceps would lead to tendinosis of the tendon, which then leads to swelling and subsequent degeneration, which then leads to fraying of the biceps. So if this continues, the biceps gets thickened and resulting in what's called an hourglass biceps. Basically the intraarticular portion of the biceps gets extremely thickened and therefore it cannot slide out through the groove. So every time you full flex the arm, the patient experiences pain because the biceps will then buckle into the joint and impinge against the humeral head. Inflammatory conditions, one of secondary nature, these are usually related to inflammatory disorders or a frozen shoulder in its acute phase. Secondary tenosynovitis may be secondary to pulley lesions and cuff tears, and these also will then lead to subsequent tendon fraying and degeneration. So on these slides, you can see the, uh, on the pictures on the right, we'll see uh, fraying of the biceps. And this is, when you go in the joint, this the biceps has not been drawn to the joint, but you can see that the biceps is frayed. At the bottom of the screen on the left, on, uh, on the left shows extra articular fraying of the biceps. So there's sound of biceps related to a frozen shoulder, and this leads to inflammation also of the biceps tendon sheet. And trauma is uh, another thing that will cause bicep pathology. So if you look at the screen on the right, the center of the humeral head is the red line, but the biceps lies at 30 degrees anterior to this. So therefore any movements of the shoulder would lead to um, uh, excessive force on the anterior part of the biceps and on the subscapularis, and therefore will lead to subsequent failure. So basically, if you use the arm, the biceps tends to always bear down anteriorly and therefore tends to dislocate or become unstable. If you could excuse me a minute, please, guys, I was going to do something. <coughs> Uh, sorry about that, there's a lot of noise coming through. Um, so anyway, I gave you a chance to look at this video, uh, this picture, and you can see that the biceps is at 30 degrees compared to the center of the humeral head. So acute injuries may lead to rupture, but repetitive injuries is what we see more commonly. These are usually seen in young sportsmen, especially those involved in overhead activities, such as swimmers, throwers, gymnasts, and those involved in martial arts. Uh, with this trauma, you may see associated other pathology like synovitis, tears, instability, slap regions, and other rotator pathology. So, uh, <clears throat> acute, in this case, you'll see on screen on the left that this is an acute rupture, but you also notice that the tendon is quite thickened, and that is what led to the subsequent rupture of the biceps. So, that was trauma. What about biceps instability? So Bennett classified biceps instability, trying to identify where the pathology would be. So in type one, there's an undersurface tear of the subcapillaris and a pulley lesion of the medial pulley. So screen on the right shows you the medial pulley, which is usually formed by subscapularis, the coracohumeral ligament, as well as the superior glenohumeral ligament. And that basically snugs the biceps medially. 
And this is, as mentioned, because of the angle of the biceps, instability is almost invariably medium. Uh, on our ultrasound, if you push biceps, And on this, you'll see an arthroscopy. That's what you're seeing anteriorly, the subscapularis. This is the bicep tendon. You see the fraying of the biceps, slamylosynovitis. And then we would forward flex the arm and put our camera down the biceps sheath. And there you see a tear of the medial pulley, which is not evident on the initial arthroscopy. So you need to identify this is a type one biceps tendon pulley lesion, and that will need surgery, uh, surgical intervention to. Um, type 2 biceps instability is when there's a full disruption of both subscapularis as well as the medial pulley. And this will allow the biceps to now slide into this, uh, into the medial area. So this video demonstrates the biceps sliding down into a subscapularis tear. And obviously in this case, the medial pulley has also been disrupted. Type three tears are those with this complete dislocation of the bicep. This means a complete subscap tear as well as anterior capsule and medial pulley. And in this, you'll see in this case in the video on the right, uh, just go back a second. Uh, so on the picture on the right, we see the biceps. Now initial impression when you put the camera in, this looks like the middle glenohumeral ligament. But this actually in this shoulder, which is the right shoulder, shows an obvious dislocation of the biceps intra-articulate. The video on this shows a full subscap tear, as you can see. And that's a complete tear of the upper third and probably upper two thirds of subscap, mark fraying of the biceps, as you see. Lateral instability, as I mentioned, most of these are medial, but occasionally we see that the there's stability of the biceps to the lateral side. This is usually due to disruption of the lateral pulley and usually follows either fractures, dislocations, or rotator cuff tears. So in this video, you'll see a spring and damage to the biceps, an intact medial pulley. But in this, you will find that there's a tear of the supraspinatus, which is now leading to instability of biceps laterally. So as you can imagine, as you internally rotate the arm, the biceps will slide out laterally. And this is a source of pain for this patient. Sometimes you'll see that there's a complete disruption of the exit of the transverse humeral ligament. And this will allow the biceps to now dislocate anterior to the subscapularis. What you need to know, uh, what we call the sentinel sign, you'll see as you pull in the biceps that there's fraying of the biceps on the anterior aspect. And that should give out a red flag to tell you that there's definitely some sort of pathology in relation to the subscapularis or of the medial pulley. So how do we manage proximal biceps lesions? Uh, this has been widely and extensively uh, looked at in multiple uh, clinical studies. And we looked at tenotomy versus tenodesis. And further on, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing a tenotomy versus tenodesis? So a tenotomy will, uh, is easy to do, but results in the cosmetic deformity of the arm, which is what we know as the Popeye sign. And they do experience cramping or soreness in the biceps muscle on exertion of the biceps. Strength and, difficult and uh, def deficits in the elbow and, and supination strength is only partially affected and not significantly affect the patient. Complications, however, with tenodesis, uh, these include a lot of hardware complications where you have disruption and loss of the hardware, including loss of fixation, and this will result in a Popeye sign. Patients initially have residual groove pain, and if you do not release the transverse humeral ligament, the transverse humeral ligament carries a lot of sympathetic nerve fibers and if you leave that intact and do a bicep tenodesis, this will result in groove pain. So if you release the transverse humeral ligament and do the bicep tenodesis, that is not an issue anymore in my practice. Uh, the number of complications, as you can see, go on, including infection, stiffness, 
uh, neurological or vascular problems, uh, and proximal humeral fracture, which you'll see with other techniques. So, tenotomy is a quicker recovery because you don't need to immobilize the patient. It is simple and there's no cost involved in terms of hardware. Problem is that Popeye deformities are present in 60% of times, and this may not be acceptable to some patients uh, due to the cosmetic deformity. As you mentioned, cramping uh, is one of the issues, but these tend to settle down over a six month period. It does, however, persist if you're dealing with doing a lot of manual work, and this can persist uh, for quite a long time. The reason I know that is because I've had a biceps uh, tenotomy, which has led to cramping with excessive strenuous activities. But this is not on a daily basis, and therefore there's an argument that, yeah, it might work. Tenodesis gives better strength, um, especially in young adults. But as I mentioned, and all the studies, hardware complications uh, are very common. There's longer operative time. And because you have to immobilize your arm for at least four weeks is, and then go on rehab, there's a longer recovery period. But if we look at both of them, there are no significant differences in functional outcomes. So tenotomy, as I mentioned, is quick and cheap. All you need is a sharp knife or a hot knife to cut the biceps from its superior labrum origin. So we don't want to leave a piece of biceps in the joint, which might lead to entrapment of that stump in the biceps. Unfortunately, if you look at the screens on the right, we have a young muscular individual who's had a rupture of the biceps and you can see the large Popeye sign evidence. The screen on the right shows you a much more less muscular individual and that Popeye sign is not evident and that patient tolerates this deformity. So therefore we would do this in the elderly, it is in the low sedentary type of patients or those in whom the Popeye deformity will not be noticed. And that means very uh, obese type of patients, or those who are very, um, um, who are thin and is not so noticeable in those patients. So therefore, uh, tenotomy would probably not be indicated uh, in the next group of patients who are young, active individuals, and more so patients who do a lot of supination activities. Now, if you look, if you do any handiwork and also in theater, when we tighten screws, they also always involve supination. And that's the function of biceps. So therefore, if somebody is using a lot of manual tools, they will not tolerate having a tenotomy. Tenodesis uh, is therefore the next option. And the location is either intraarticular, either suprapectoral, which is either, which is therefore extraarticular, and this is usually done in the biceps groove or it could be subpectral, and this is below the pec major tendon, and these are usually done in open technique. Sometimes we we'll go in and do a rotator cuff repair and add uh, one of these loose sutures and use that to repair the biceps to the adjacent rotator cuff. Otherwise, um, we would then consider tenodesis and intraarticular tenodesis is indicated in my practice in those patients who have flap lesions with no evidence of fraying of the distal biceps. The way this is done, I would use what is called a loop and tack super suture technique. So in this initial uh, uh, slide on the left, we create a loop, which is a cinched loop around the biceps. We then pass one of the loops of the suture back forward and then retrieve it back through the tendon. And that creates a strong grip on the tendon. So this is called a loop on tack, loop and tack. And we then repair this with an octus anchor. So you see the video on the top, the loop and tack suture has been passed. And this is an octus anchor that we are using to secure the biceps. So after you've done this, you then need to do a biceps tenotomy. And because you did sew the biceps uh, would it still attach? Uh, you maintain adequate length in the biceps. 
uh, without worrying about the Popeye deformity. So once this biceps is done, you can see on the video at the bottom that there's a loop and tack technique and this anchor is placed just outside the articular cartilage margin of the humeral head. So the loop and tack essentially is just a suture technique that catches the biceps and is then fixed intra-articularly. So that's one technique of repairing the biceps. So outcome studies from loop and tack, te uh, loop and tack technique uh, showed that there was 91% good and excellent results with no Popeye deformity, but some patients still experienced some cramping in the arm. But this was acceptable outcomes. And then if we can't do this intra-articular where there is significant fraying of the biceps or, or if there's been biceps instability, uh, we would consider doing a suprapectoral tenodesis. And this means an extra-articular tenodesis. There are many ways of doing this. And there's either an inlay technique or an onlay technique. The inlay technique requires an interfer interference screw fixation. And in this, we uh, initially put a cinch loop on the biceps so we can maintain the length. Uh, the biceps is then tenotomized. Uh, we incise the bicep tendon by this little sizer on the, on the second uh, image. And on the third image, once we've created the size, we would go up one centimeter. So if we size the size five, we would then draw the size six. Um, that's to accommodate the biceps, uh, as the biceps will then be pushed into the groove and held with the interfering screw. So therefore, you do need to create a little space for the, the screw as well as the fold of biceps. So you can see um, in step four, uh, uh, this little snare holds the biceps and then pushes it into the drill hole you've made, which is usually about 20 millimeters in length. And an interference screw uh, of that diameter is then inserted and held in uh, and, and, so, and, and secures the biceps. So here's the interference screw fixation. You can see that there's screw fixation. Uh, with <clears throat> and we'll look at these, we use an interference screw. And the screen on the right shows you it's quite secure fixation. And this has been shown to have the best fixation in terms of biomechanical studies. But as I said, we've had fixation failure of these. You can see a loose anchor on this ultrasound and oscopic views of a, a pulled out interference screw. And we still have Popeye deformities developing after this uh, technique of interference, interference group fixation up to 30%. And that wasn't acceptable. Why did it disrupt? The mode of failure was only the, at the bone tendon junction. And you can see that this is a killer turn with sharp edges of the, of the cortical bone in this region. And you're fitting a screw into that, that canal. So with repetitive motion, the biceps usually will fail at this junction. So I had a few experiences with this and therefore have moved on to what is called an onlay technique. And uh, would we use suture anchors for this? Of course, the traditional suture anchor was used where the suture eyelet was um, the point of weakness and pull out of the suture. And we've started, I've started using all suture anchors, which showed equal outcomes compared to traditional anchors and no pull out of the anchor. Uh, this study of biomechanical analysis of all suture anchors was done, I think, from Dr. Mbugwa's experiences with Dr. Brian Cole and Tony Romeo. So on the onlay technique, I usually pull aside the biceps, and this is done outside the biceps, uh, outside the joint, and pull out the biceps, prepare the groove, uh, bring it down to bare bone. I then lose, use a double-loaded suture anchor, and in this case, we are showing uh, an old traditional metal anchor. Uh, we then pass lasso loops or cinch loops or luggage tail loops around the biceps with one of the limbs of the sutures. And you see below on the left that we repeat the step of the second suture. And on the video, you'll see the cinch loop pulling this tendon down nicely. And that brings the tendon right down into the biceps groove. So this is a nice technique to hold on the biceps. And with the old switch anchor, uh, this is another company, but basically they all have a double loaded uh, tape 
and they have small a smaller diameter. And because of this, I actually put two anchors, not one. So in this, you will see a, 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 a lasso loops and proximal biceps tendon in the video. And we would then add a second anchor above that. So what happens if you have extensive degeneration? In this, you'll see that there's significant degeneration of the bicep. Therefore, you do need to always expose the bicep extra articularly to see this frame down, because you can't see these yet. You now need to consider doing the biceps repair below the pec, which will then become a subpectoral tenodesis. We also would then consider subpectoral tenodesis when you're doing revision biceps tenodesis. So in this, you can see we're pulling the bicep and look at the significant frame as it's going down at the groove and below the pec measure. So that one will be a case for a subpec tenodesis. How do we do a subpectoral tenodesis? You need to identify the inferior border of the pec measure because this is where the biceps lie. Uh, you would place your anchor underneath the pec major. And in this case, we use an interference screw fixation. Uh, so we make an incision, usually vertical, or if you want transverse. The main structures to be wary of on the medial lies, the median and muscular planus nerves, and these are at risk if you do not identify them. So stay lateral. When you make the incision, stay to this lateral end of the pec major. Try and feel the groove of the biceps. And that is when, where you will find the biceps. So be careful, do not dissect the median nerve because it does look like the biceps when you do dissect it. So in this case, you'll see, we will then, once we've identified the biceps, we retrieve it out of the joints. Uh, we will then whip stitch the tendon and we then will drill a tunnel at the inferior border of pec. Because this is hard cortical bone, we always over drill, so we go up to um, a bigger size than what the diameter of the tendon measures. We also use a tap before inserting the biceps in the screw because this is cortical bone. The trick is to place the muscle belly at the level of the inferior border of pec, this is the right tension to achieve for the proximal biceps. This is an important point to remember. The muscle belly must be the lower border of pec. But interference crew fixation in this place, once again, showed good biomechanical pull-out strength. But we did experience fracture through the drill hole. And you can see this is a little, uh, little spiral type of fracture. And this is on rotation of the arm. These complications are seen commonly in uh, baseball pitches because they use a lot of torque uh, on turning the arm. So to avoid this, you must always ensure that the tunnel is in the middle of the humerus. If you put it on either side, it will uh, lead to a, a risk of fracture. So I've um, also get worried about interference group fixation and therefore now use a unical cortical fixation with a button. Uh, Arthrex have pec buttons and everybody has some sort of uh, button that you'd use. We would whip stitch a tendon. Uh, normally the drill is made about aimed at 10 degrees or 20 degrees cranially because sometimes the cortex is quite thin and uh, sorry, the intermodality canal is quite thin, the thick cortices. So if you drill, you won't be able to flip the button. So if you aim it slightly superior, Flipping of the button becomes easier. So once you flip the button, you will then tie sutures, and that will then ensure that you have your biceps secure at this point. So in summary, the proximal biceps, groove tenderness is diagnostic. You need to do a careful assessment of pulleys and of subscapularis at the time of arthroscopy. We know that tenotomy and tenodesis have similar outcomes, but in young, active male manual workers, probably a tenodesis is preferred. The location of the tenodesis and fixation methods have shown no difference in the outcomes. So you need to look at the bicep and decide how much damage is there. Is this a superior label chair? I'll do that intra-articular. If there's biceps instability or associated cuff chairs, you may want to do it in the bicep screw. But if you have extensive fraying of the biceps, 
or revision cases, you will then have to consider a suprapectoral tenodesis. The method of fixation, uh, say in my hands, I tend to do onlay techniques and anchor fixations rather than interference group fixations in my practice nowadays. So we therefore know that arthroscopic tenodesis also has good results. And therefore, in my practice, if I have no distal pathology of the bicep, I would always do an arthroscopic uh, tenodesis. And of course, you mentioned that subpec tenodesis has been reserved for those in revision cases or extensive frame. All right, so should I go on from there or should I continue with the distal biceps? Uh, maybe I'll talk about the distal biceps. Yeah, I think you can just proceed, then we can discuss uh, both. Okay, thank you. So we all aware of the anatomy of the distal biceps is we know that the biceps uh, will then insert distally into the ulnar side of the radial tuberosity. It does have this little band called the Lysertus fibrosis, which does not provide significant strength for the biceps. Um, the incidence of distal bicep rupture though is small, the only incidence of 2% and is almost exclusively seen in males. This is due to sudden eccentric contraction. So if you try the elbow flex and something falls in your arm, suddenly extends and you try to protect that, that eccentric contraction would lead to distal bicep rupture. We also know the bicep will rupture after chronic degeneration of the biceps. Uh, examination of the distal biceps reveals ecchymosis in the skin and um, loss of uh, tendon where the tendon will now retract proximally. And of course, significant weakness of elbow flexion and forearm supination. So this is totally different from the proximal biceps because loss of strength in the proximal biceps is only up to 10%, uh, but distal biceps leads to significant loss of uh, function. Ultrasound and MRI is diagnostic for all distal biceps rupture. Clinical examination can, can, uh, include the hook test. You pass your finger from the lateral and in this case, you can see you can hook the biceps. So obviously a bicep rupture would not be, uh, you would not be able to get, uh, feel the biceps. The bicep squeeze test is like doing, uh, squeezing the calf for testing for the uh, Achilles tendon. So essentially you keep the arm, uh, elbow flexed about 50 degrees, pronate the forearm and then squeeze the biceps. And if the forearm starts to supinate, then that biceps is intact. So this is the bicep squeeze test. So how do you manage distal biceps? We know that if you do not repair the distal biceps, there's a significant loss of strength, 50% loss of sustained supination, supination strength, 40% loss of supination strength, and 30% loss of flexion strength, and 15% loss of distal grip strength. So there's significant fallout in terms of strength and hence functional disability in these patients. So therefore invariably, if you have a very low demand patient with significant comorbidities, we may consider conservative management, but otherwise surgical management in, is invariably recommended for these patients. Surgery may be either in a non-anatomic zone, so you may be able to suture the biceps to the brachialis and that will accentuate the contractility strength of the brachialis. And this is a non-anatomic uh, construction. Anatomic reconstruction is you would then reattach this to the radial tuberosity. How do you do this? If you use an anterior single incision, which is where our newer devices allow us to do, where we use anchor fixation or button fixation. Uh, we, are, however, do see problems, and these are usually related to the nerves in this region, such as uh, lateral continuous nerve of the forearm, more importantly, the posterior interosseous nerve, and the radial nerve, if you get that far. The incidence of these injuries is about 2%, two, sorry, almost 3% compared to significantly less uh, injuries to these nerves if you use a dual incision technique. The dual incision technique was initially described and you will expose the biceps proximally, uh, sorry, anteriorly as well as posteriorly. And this obviously then protect the posterior interosseous nerve and you will then do your fixation. A, um, however, the problem was that heterotopic ossification between the radius and ulna, uh, there was a, quite a high incidence of this. And that leads to further disability and deformity. 
if you look at re-rupture rates, the dual incision at a much lower re-rupture rate compared to the single incision techniques. So how do you avoid these nerve injuries, especially of the posterior nerve injuries? So there's been studies that come up from New Zealand and other areas to show that the drilling and the way you drill affects uh, oh, sorry, will protect the posterior interosseous nerve. So surgery for the distal bicep, the timing is either acute, subacute, or chronic, or if there's been failed management of partial tears of the distal biceps. So you do get partial tears of the biceps, and if these conservative management fails, which it does because the biceps are so strong, uh, you will then consider surgery. However, if you have a chronic tear, this lead requires extensive dissection and there is definitely shortening and loss of the tendon and therefore these need to be augmented with either a hamstring autograft or an Achilles allograft. Fixation of this lead is either done with switch anchors, uh, interference screws a button and my practice I tend to prefer button fixation. So how do we do these surgery? I use a transverse incision about two centimeters below the elbow crease and this gives you a nice cosmetic outcome. I initially use soft tissue dissection to identify the proximal biceps, and you need to fish it out from proximally by lifting up the superior flap as a skin incision. Once the biceps is identified, we burn it into the wound. We usually need to trim this down to at least a five or six millimeter diameter, and then we'll pass a whip stitch around uh, the uh, distal tendon. We then, I would then use uh, finger dissection to get down to the radial tuberosity and usually that's once you fall it down they bring you right up to the radial tuberosity supinate the forearm to feel the tuberosity i uh, will then start your drilling aim keep the arm supinated and enter uh, central and the radial tuberosity and you aim 30 degrees on upward so at this point in time i usually go to the top bottom of the table to make sure that I'm drilling at 30 degrees because despite the fact that the arm is turbinated fully, uh, the post interest nerve is still at risk. So the best and uh, scientific studies have come out to show that 30 degrees on the woods is the way you drill. So you drill a five to six millimeter uh, hole depending on uh, what's, uh, what the size of the tendon is. Uh, we then would load the anchor. So you pass the sutures, uh, sorry, to the button. So we pass the sutures initially through the holes in the bottom and then loop them back through the holes. So now your sutures will be lying in your hands. You will then insert the button through the tunnel you've made and then you'll need to flip the button. So you'll flip it like you do in an ACL. And once it is flipped, you test that the button is secure. And then by pulling on this and juggling on those two suture limbs that are available, the biceps will be drawn down into the bias, into the groove. Uh, what I forgot to mention is that we, sorry, we, when we drill the um, tunnel, so this, the KY is only a 3.2 millimeter drill, but you drill a five millimeter tunnel for the biceps, which is unicortical. And that means that there's a small hole in the uh, distal cortex and a bigger hole in the proximal cortex, the small holes to allow the button to flip and the bigger hole on the proximal cortex is to allow the biceps to actually enter the bone and seat yourself there. Once you've achieved that fixation, you will then tie sutures on that to ensure that there's no slippage of this area. So in summary, distal biceps rupture is not well tolerated. Uh, we prefer a single incision with a button fixation because of the smaller diameter of the button. Careful drilling and direction of the drill will avoid potential nerve injuries. Uh, the lateral cutaneous nerve lies laterally to, in your incision. So you've got to be careful in the incision to not damage the lateral cutaneous nerve. Revision cases, however, for distal biceps uh, will require graft extension uh, to achieve uh, fixation. So we basically will put the graft initially into the uh, biceps, into the radial tuberosity, secure that point. The graft is then brought proximally to the biceps and you will determine tension and use the pulvertaft weave technique to pass the graft into the distal biceps muscle. So yes, and finally, this is biceps in the joint, and this is with a massive rotator cuff tear. 
And we use the biceps, basically we bring it across to the greatest tuberosity and fix at that point. And this acts as a superior capsular reconstruction. So a mild plea is save the biceps, just don't kill it. Because the biceps could be used for superior capsular reconstruction. It could be used as a biceps augmentation to your rosetic up repair. So I thank you for your attention and I hope you'll be happy with this talk that I have given. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, I think that was well, well articulated, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, guys, please feel free to just share your questions in the chat. I, if I may just start, let me, let me ask you a question as we get some questions from the chat. Uh, because we, from a diagnostic standpoint, mostly clinical diagnosis is the, is the mainstay. Um, and for you to actually find pathology like tears, you said uh, arthroscopy is probably what will give you the best. MRI is really, I think you quoted about 37%. Uh, given that we wouldn't know until you go for arthroscopy, I just wanted to find out what, what would be your comment about the role of injections? If you're not sure about the pathology, um, I mean, clinically they're fine because you have, well, I think we've talked about surgery. At when would you consider doing a cortical steroid injection for the biceps, especially pro proximal biceps? Oops. Sorry, um, uh, thank you, that's a good question. Uh, we use diagnostic injection in the biceps as a diagnostic. So if you're not sure what's going on, uh, you can inject the biceps groove area. And if the pain disappears during all those clinical tests, that disappears, that's suggestive of biceps pathology. Conservative management, such as uh, cortisone injections to the biceps sheet, you saw that you could get primary or secondary bicep tendonitis or tenosynovitis. And that may be an indication for you to do a bicep tendon injection. You know that you don't want to inject the tendon. And that's why we would tend to recommend that this be done under ultrasound guidance so you can avoid injecting into the tendon. Uh, conservative management of bicep pathology works, but it not, uh, does not resolve all patient symptoms. It probably works in about 60% of the time. Uh, and the patient will sometimes return with uh, recurrent pain in the bicep region. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. That answers my question. I think we have one question from Makina, but I, let me ask you one more question. Yes. When, when we talk about tenodesis, what are we going more for to restore strength or is just to take, take away our Popeye's sign? The reason I ask that is the technique we use, does it matter if it's a young rugby player or a young weightlifter or uh, someone who's really active versus a 60-year-old uh, does the technique matter uh, with regards to fixation and restoration of strength of the biceps? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a big difference, of course. You know, uh, a low-demand patient, um, you know, with those patients, I would probably not even consider it tenodesis, you know, you know, but maybe a tenotomy, uh, especially if they are kind of obese arms, they would not notice that biceps pop by sign. So yes, loss of biceps approximately is mainly a cosmetic problem. Because as I mentioned, uh, strength is not a big problem. So most of the time it becomes a cosmetic issue uh, if you have a Popeye sign. But some patients would not tolerate a Popeye sign. And you see in very muscular individuals uh, who do, would not like the look of a Popeye sign. Uh, much more leaner type of individuals uh, it would be noticed and they might tolerate it better. But we also talked about return of strength because we do a tenotomy, you can get cramping on excessive stress and use of the biceps. So cramping becomes a problem in a very active manual type of worker. And of course, if you have somebody who's doing weightlifting, they're not gonna like to have a bicep drop set because they go to the gym to show a good biceps. <laughs> they're not gonna have a nice biceps. So active individuals, Usually males with uh, well-formed musculature, uh, you would want to consider doing a tenodesis rather than a tenotomy. At the same time, tenotomy is well-tolerated. It's quicker recovery time. It's much more cost-effective. 
And I think if you look at insurance payments, you get paid the same for doing a tenotomy or a tenodesis. So you need to do a tenodesis in the patient whom you feel the patient will require it on, as those I mentioned to you now. Uh, and, you know, as I said, to avoid all these hardware failures that we've seen, um, you know, if you're not an experienced surgeon, it adds a significant amount of time to your operation. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it can be done in a few minutes uh, quite quickly once you get experience with it. Uh, hardware failure, and that's one of the reasons why I've gone away from interfering screws or traditional anchors, and now use all suture anchors, and we don't see too many problems with that fixation method. Um, sorry, I think I missed a, uh, part of the question there, Francis. Um, no, no, it's good. I think you know, you've answered. I think you've answered. You've answered the, the question. Yeah. The, so let me. There's uh, we have uh, there are two questions uh, in the in the uh, from the chat. So Dr. McKenna asks, uh, which would be common for weightlifters and bodybuilders? Would it be the proximal biceps or distal biceps uh, tendon ruptures? And the second question is, when can they return to weightlifting? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, weightlifters, because of the repetitive action of, uh, and I showed you the anatomy of the biceps line more in the front, so it bears down at the front of the shoulder. So any repetitive, rotational, repetitive action leads to frame of the medial pulley and subsequent rupture, and to, uh, sorry, and subsequent instability of biceps. So weightlifters tend to usually get more proximal bicep problems, but as I said, if they have a sudden acute eccentric contraction of the biceps, such as suddenly uh, forcing the arm being forced into extension and they resist that, they can develop a distal bicep problem. But I mean, I see much more proximal biceps lesions than I do distal biceps lesions. So yes, in weightlifters it's more proximal because of the repetitive motion. That they achieve. Uh, when can they return to weightlifting? You need for the biceps to heal. And we know that these weight trainers go back, and when they return, they usually go back to the same weight they had stopped using. So, therefore, there are crazy guys who want to return back to where they are. And in those patients, I'll always use a double fixation, double anchor fixation, approximately, to get a secure fixation on the biceps. They will need to rest their arm and not do any activities of the biceps for four weeks post-operatively. They can only get back to gym at three months. So that's quite nasty, but if they want a good cosmetic outcome and a good functional outcome, they will need to do the time. So I think that answers your question from uh, Dr. McKenna. Uh, yes, it does. She, she asks a question, I guess a lot of people will be interested because of uh, trauma. Uh, how, what would you do with the long head of biceps and fixing proximal humeral fractures? Uh, routine tenotomy or just ignore it or you know, diss it? Uh, you know, I mean, in that case, everything's exposed, isn't it? The whole proximal humerus is exposed, put fractured plates there. A lot of these proximal humeral plates have fixed uh, eyelets and then the suturing. Uh, so I would always tenodise the biceps but not doing secure fixations like this because we know there's going to be much more reaction. So I'll use one anchor fixation or sometimes just suture either to the soft tissues or to the plate that you're putting on. So yes, I will always tenodize the proximal biceps when dealing with humeral fractures. Um, sometimes, of course, if you're dealing with a nasty humeral fracture, uh, you could leave that biceps alone if you feel that's going to take too much time during the course of surgery. And we know that the functional outcomes are pretty much the same. Uh, they probably have more problems with the proximal humerus than with the biceps, the initial phase. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, that does. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Shamim. Um, if, there, if there's any other question, feel free to ask. But uh, I think if there are no other questions, I would love to end this session. We're very uh, grateful, uh, Doc, for just taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, just doing that. Thank you so much, guys, for coming and for your participation, uh, uh, for making this happen. Uh, please answer the poll uh, on your way out. Uh,
and have a nice weekend ahead. Irene, uh, if there are any announcements, please you can give that to us. Uh, if they are not, then see you all. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. I thank you, everybody. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you've actually allowed me to give this talk, and I hope it's been knowledgeable enough for you. Thank you so much again, and hope to see you in Kenya sometime. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.